Welcome to Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Planting the seed of truth and growing families in the Word of God. We, we talked, we covered a lot of territory last week. I know a lot of you were over there setting up for the church picnic, but just to really encourage each other to live life together outside of the church walls is really what the church is meant to be. And we'll talk a little bit more about that today. In, in covering, just real quick review, as quick as I can, we covered Acts 2, where it talked about them being mutually linked to one another. It talks about them sharing and meeting and celebrating, really doing life together in every aspect of the word and enjoying one another. We covered Galatians 6.10. It talked about us being mindful. I really like that one, to be mindful, to be a blessing. It says, especially to those of the household of faith. We are a family, and I'm not just talking about RCC, although specifically you are the people I hang with. Um, I love the people at First Assembly. I love the people at NLC. I love the people, oh goodness, I've got friends at every church in town. And, and, and we, our love is because of our mutual father. It makes us family. But in particular, those of the household of faith that we serve and that we worship together, we're to be mindful to be a blessing to each other. We're not just supposed to meet in here at 10.15 every Sunday morning, come in and leave. It's either amen or oh me. Who is it that says that? Mark 3, we talked about Jesus, looked at the crowd around him, and he said, they said, your mom, your, bro your brothers, they're out there, they're needing you. And he said, who is my mother and my brothers? Is it not you? I mean, man, go back and study that. We were supposed to be concentrating on that this week, that Jesus considered those that followed him to be his family, even stronger than blood. We talked about Philippians 2, 1 through 4, being of one mind, of one purpose, being interested in each other. Interested in each other, not superficially, but interested in each other. Who are you? What is your story? And getting to know each other on that level. John 13, the reason I'm giving you all these is because a lot of people think it's scriptural just to come in, sing, and say amen and go home. I don't think that's scriptural church. I think that's the start of what we do. John 13, 35 talks about loving one another and that because of the love that people see between us as different as we are, that they can see us function as a family and love each other in spite of our differences, over our differences, that is how people will know that we are disciples of Christ. This is, this is how they will know, hey, <laughs> they have to be a Christian, why? Because we supernaturally dwell together. It's powerful. You and I are to come together at a common table. And I look around this room and there's so many differences. I mean, I don't know if y'all know this or not. And please nobody boo at either team here. But, but we have Democrats and Republicans in this room. Y'all should run for Congress. Because... <laughs> Here you are in the same room. You're not throwing insults at each other. You're singing together. You're worshiping together. And I would, I would say there's probably other political parties in this room as well. You disagree on certain aspects, maybe on things on the economy or foreign affairs, yet you come together, you worship together, you learn together, and you enjoy each other. That's a lesson that we need to hold on to in the body of Christ. And I was really going to pick on LSU this morning, but Brother Jerry's not here. Uh, I could probably get a Texas Longhorn somewhere in the back. I will not identify you for your own safety. <laughs> However, I've seen, I've seen the pool table and I, I saw the orange. Um, you know, when you deck out your house in certain teams, people are going to know who you are. And so you might want to go incognito when people come over, throw the Razorback ball out on the pool table. We've got people in here. We're different. And you'd be amazed what people fight over. Be amazed over what a fight can start over different teams. There's only one baseball team. Go Cards. Okay. Okay. 
we laugh about these things, but these are the things that people fight over and separate themselves from each other over. And we're supposed to be finding things to be in common over. And we have that one most important thing. We are Christians. We are the body of Christ. We are followers of Christ. And if we're going to be able to come together in unity, then we've got to find something that's bigger than ourselves. And, you know, society really longs for that. Look around you at the clubs, the groups, the teams, the different things that people feel a need to group together. But most of the time, it's not the important things that we're grouping together over or that we're separating over. We have something bigger than ourselves, and it's, it's more important than an organization or an event. Go with me to Hebrews 10. Let's get some word in here. Man, I couldn't, get past, I couldn't get past the first part of verse 21 of Hebrews 10 before having to stop. I'm reading out of the NIV, Hebrews 10, 21. We're kind of jumping in the middle here, but the part that's above is really great. So it talks about Jesus being our high priest. And it says, And since we have a great priest over the house of God, I just had to stop right there. I mean, we read in Galatians 6 last week, put it in your review notes, he called us the household of faith. Here we see he calls us the house of God. And I, I thought about that day. I thought, the house of God. The house of God. You know what we are? We are supernatural family. The household of God, the household of faith, we are a, it's impossible for us to dwell together in unity. But we have the same father. We love the same Lord. We have the same Savior. And because of that, we are the household of faith. We are a household because of what we believe. We are the house of God because of God, because of the Father. That's what we are, supernatural family. Every single time we gather here, it's supernatural. Now, I knew what I was teaching this morning. So when y'all are back here just praising and worshiping, I'm sitting here thinking, this moment right now with these Democrats and Republicans in the same room, with these casino, anti-casino people in the same room, with the poor, the rich, the educated, the uneducated, the black, the white, the Hispanic, the white, white, white with red hair. <laughs> Here we are in the same room, worshiping together on, on the same note, mostly, at the same time, that is supernatural and we don't we don't to notice that moment will make this body of people beautiful to you it'll make church have more meaning to you if you realize what was just accomplished here it's beautiful it's absolutely supernatural it, it's, it's strangely wonderful what just happened in the room now we can go to skip down to verse 24 hebrews 10 verse 24 it says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. We're talking about the church. We're supposed to be considering how we're supposed to spur one another, encourage one another in how to love and do good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. You know, it, it's hard for me because, you know, the crowds go down a little bit, although I can't say that much anymore on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights because, man, it's, it's grown. A lot of churches aren't having night service anymore. And, and I have people ask me, well, who says we have to have church three nights a week? Nobody does. I personally need church seven days a week. But we have other things we have to take care of. And so I don't want anybody to feel condemned over not coming to church three times a week. But by all means, if you need that encouragement and you need that spurring, it's here for you. It's here for you. We're here for you. And I mean, we have, actually, we have four services a week right now because we have ladies' Bible study on Tuesday mornings. And some of you are making four services a week. How many of you are making four services a week? Raise your hand high. <laughs> Wes comes to ladies' Bible study. 
He does our praise and worship. In case y'all are wondering, men are not generally invited. It's Wes does the praise and worship. It took me a minute there, Wes. Why? We need it. And if you can't do it, you've got to find another way to feel that. You will find another way to feel that. And so this isn't a come to church message. This is a why. And to realize the importance of it and to make use of it and to see how much we need one another. We covered last week, yes, we do. Even if we think we don't, we do need each other. And he says, even, the, even more as you see the day approaching. So the worse things get out in the world, the more we're going to need to pull from each other. And that's the way the early church really was at this time period when this was being written. An attack was against the church, Eric. And, and when they would see each other, I mean, Eric's my brother. And we don't, not my flesh bone brother, he's my God brother. And and when I see you out, I mean, we mess with each other. We joke with each other and harass each other all the time. But that's love. That's our, our love language, or it's mine towards you. I don't know how you take it. But when I see Eric even out, that feels good. When I see Mary out, that, that feels good. And the reason it does, because there's this common thing in us and you know in the early church when they were being persecuted, they were literally being killed for what they believed when they would see each other. It was precious. And that's why that you read the scriptures and we kind of laugh about it now to greet each other with a holy kiss. And we're like, no, nah, no, you know, we don't even want to hug or shake hands anymore because of germs. They would see each other. They could care less about germs. They found another believer. They found somebody else who had the same Savior, who believed as they did. And yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, we've talked about putting hand sanitizer out in the foyer. I, I don't care if you want to use hand sanitizer, but my goodness, don't lose the beauty of the body of Christ. Yeah, you know, I know. Not everybody's as clean as you. I know. I'm just going to leave that there. <laughs> you can make it easier for people to love on you. <laughs> so the Amplified Version says, Let us consider and give attentive, continuous care. Man, that's a lot of adjectives. Let's, let us consider. That means we got to think about this. We don't just come into church not thinking. We don't just come into church for ourselves. We don't just come into church to get what we need to get from church or to, to check our box on of our list of, of we did our social duty for the week. He wants us to come in aware, considering giving attentive, continuous care to watch over one another. Studying. What? What? Studying? Studying what? How to stir each other up. That doesn't mean make each other mad, push each other's buttons. That means study how we may stir up, stimulate, incite to love and helpful deeds and noble activities. Has anybody in here in the last month studied how to encourage each other? You don't have to raise your hand because we'd all probably be real embarrassed at this moment. Thank you, Mary. I need to talk to you after church. I want us to think about this as a church body. Do we want to grow the kingdom of God? Is that our purpose? To grow the kingdom of God and to, to teach the people that come into the kingdom of God how to do the works of God, how to do the works of Christ. Isn't that, isn't that our calling as the fivefold ministry? Those of us who are called in fivefold ministry is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. That's what Scripture says. The, the only thing that's going to make people want to be on that pew beside you is you taking an interest in loving them. And you can invite them, slap on the bumper stickers, throw out the yard signs, do commercials, billboards. You can do everything you want to do. They didn't have any of that. Let's just turn there. Oh, man. Okay, let me finish, let me finish verse 24. 
of the Amplified. Stir each other up to love helpful deeds, not forsaking or neglecting to assemble together as believers, as is the habit of some, but admonishing, warning, urging, and encouraging one another, and all the more faithfully as you see the day approaching. Now go with me to Acts 2. We read it last week. I want to revisit it again today because it was such a good scripture, and so many of you were out getting our food ready. You know, when he says not forsaking or neglecting, there He's not talking about not forsaking or neglecting the church, as in the church organization. He's talking about not forsaking and neglecting each other. The people in here are the church. We can meet in this building or, or we could meet out in dad's pasture. You, that is the church, is the people. When he's talking about not neglecting or forsaking, that's what he's talking about. Not punching the time clock and coming into the service, but don't neglect and forsake each other. Because the truth is, if you're not here and we don't have contact with each other outside of here and in here, I'm going to neglect you. I'm not going to be aware. You say, well, that shouldn't be. I, I'm sorry. If we don't have contact with one another, I forget. Well, you shouldn't we shouldn't we do remember we talked about fellowship the definition last week and the the word contact that was in the definition of fellowship and how important that contact is and it's not the same when you're doing it electronically you can't pick up on what's going on in Sean's world oh you can get what he says is going on in his world but sometimes what Sean says is going in his world might be a little different than what's really going on in the heart of Sean. And contact, Cole, sorry, it just hit me. Where's Sean? He's upstairs. Cole, what's going on in him? I can only pick up hanging with him, being around him. If y'all missed the alpaca farm yesterday, y'all missed great bonding time, didn't they? Cole. His brother's name is Sean. Spend time together. It's important. Acts 2, verse 40. I'm reading out of the Passion. It says, Peter preached to them and warned them with these words, Be rescued from the wayward and perverse culture of this world. Those who believed the word that day numbered 3,000. 3,000. In that day, one day, 3,000. They were all baptized and were added to the church. Every believer was faithfully devoted to following the teachings of the apostles. Their hearts were mutually linked to one another. I love that. Sharing communion and coming together regularly for prayer. A deep sense of holy awe swept, swept over everyone, and the apostles performed many miracles, signs, and wonders. What an atmosphere it sets. All the believers were in fellowship as one body. And they shared with one another whatever they had. Out of generosity, they even sold their assets to distribute the proceeds to those who were in need among them. Daily, they met together in the temple courts and in one another's homes to celebrate communion. They shared meals together with joyful hearts and tender humility. They were continually filled with praises to God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord kept adding to their number daily those who were coming to life. That's how the church grows. And when I say the church, I'm talking about the organization. Yes, through the government, we have to have an organization. But I'm talking about the kingdom of God, the body of Christ. Believers coming in to know each other and to know God better. It grew daily. You know, none of that is what I read on these little ads that come to me every time I'm on social media about how to grow the church. It's not this. That's, but this is what the apostle wrote for us. And this is what I want to encourage us to do. In a world that's looking for differences, in a world that's looking for a fight, the church has to come to unity. It's what's going to draw people to the kingdom of God. They're going to look and say, that is supernatural what happens in that building on Sunday mornings. That's supernatural. And they're going to want to be a part of it. And to seek out a common DNA instead of looking for what's different, seeking out what's common and finding a family. Go with me to Ephesians 4. 
I'm telling you, when the church quits being an organization and starts being an influence, it'll be a force, which is what it was designed to be. Ephesians 4, verse 1. I'm reading out of the Passion Translation again. As a prisoner of the Lord, I plead with you to walk holy in a way that is suitable to your high rank, given to you in your divine calling. With tender humility and quiet patience, always demonstrate gentleness and generous love towards one another, especially towards those who may try your patience. Do I need to pause, pause there for a moment? This is what it's about, supernatural ability to be a family, even with those who try your patience. You've got children. Do they try your patience? You, do you, <laughs> that's great, Mom. You don't walk away from your children and separate from your, well, sometimes temporarily, like five minutes, to cool off. You don't cut off relationship with your children because they try your patience. You know, you're going to have people in the body of Christ that try your patience. And, and, and we can't cut them off just because we're a family. Family remains family. And so be patient with those who try your patience. Be faithful, verse 3, be faithful to guard the sweet harmony of the Holy Spirit among you in the bonds of peace. Guard it. Being one body, one spirit, as you were all called into the same glorious hope of divine destiny. For the Lord God is one, and so are we. For we share in one faith, one baptism, and one Father. And he is the perfect Father who leads us all, works through us all, and lives in us all. I think there's a point here to the word one. One. One body, one spirit, the same hope, the same destiny. God is one. We are one. One faith, one baptism, one Father. That's one. He's making a point. We're supposed to be one. The force in the, in the earth that the church, the family of God can be when we function as one. We know the power of unity. I, I had to take us back to Genesis 11 and and. This is going to take you back to Sunday school days when you, when you studied the Tower of Babel. But I want you to see the power of being unified. Now, this is in the opposite direction, but it still proves a great point. And this story is told in Genesis 11. I'm going to read it to you because some of the wording here is, is quite powerful. Starting in verse 1, it said, Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. That's what they had in common. They had one language and one common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar, and they settled there. And they said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. And then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city. And the tower that the men were building. And the Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. What? This was without God. This was man's selfish motive, wanting to make a name for themselves wanting to do this for themselves, but the power of the unity of them speaking one speech and having one goal in common, God himself came down to look at it and said, if they can do this in one speech and in one goal, they can do anything they plan and accomplish it. And God said, we got to do something about this. Let's go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. You know what happened when, when they uh, got out of unity? It stopped. We've got to stay in unity, church. 
not just with each other here, but with all of, all of the body of Christ. I, look, we're different. We're a different church. The Presbyterian church is a different church. The Methodist church is a different church. They're different churches. They have different personalities. They have different callings, different missions, different things that they stand for. We have one Father. If they've made Jesus the Lord of their life, we have one Father. We have one goal, build the kingdom, build the kingdom, build the kingdom, build the kingdom. And what's going to build the kingdom? Us loving them, them living, loving us. Us respecting them, them respecting us. That's when people are going to look and go, this is something different. This is supernatural. How on earth are they gathering together and loving each other? So the Lord scattered them from all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world, and from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Democrats, Republicans, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, men, women. It all disappears if we can keep one goal, build the kingdom. Build the kingdom. It's a mystery. <laughs> the scripture calls it a mystery of how we can all become one and become a supernatural family. It's a mystery. Don't try to figure it out. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep, your, keep the goal set in front of you. Build the kingdom. That's what we're here for. And it, church is not just about me. Church is not just about you. Church is not just about what you can get from church. Church is what you can give each other. It's how am I going to encourage somebody today? How am I going to be aware? Am I going to study how to help people? Am I going to study how to encourage people? I love that in that scripture. Study? Really? Study it? Yes, not me study it, or not just me study it as the pastor, but you study it. You study how to encourage each other, how to build each other up. Go with me to Ephesians 2. Man, is that clock right? Is it really 11.15? Y'all can get out early today. Maybe. This is pretty good right here. Ephesians 2, verse 11. Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men. He, he, he's, here came the deal with Jesus. You know, we had the Jews, and we had the uncircumcised. That was basically the circumcised and the uncircumcised. Those were the two groups of people in the earth. Jesus comes and creates this great issue, because now it's not about circumcision anymore. Now it's about circumcision of the heart instead of the flesh. And so now we have uh, the, the Jewish people who are going, wait, they're getting in on the covenant and they haven't been circumcised? You know, so there, here, there's this battle going on and, and Jesus is trying to unify everybody. And really it, it caused great division for a while. So the apostle's trying to clear all this up. And he said, look, you know, these are called Gentiles, uncircumcised. They're calling themselves circumcised. But verse 12, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise, the uncircumcised, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one. No longer, no longer two separate groups of people here. He's the peace. He's what brought peace, not just to them and themselves, but between each other. Jesus brought peace, and he made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. 
and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Jesus, he leveled the playing field, ladies and gentlemen. He made it possible for anybody to approach the Father through him. Circumcised, uncircumcised, didn't matter anymore. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone, he sets it all. It's all built on him. It's all kept in line by him, the chief cornerstone. In him, Jesus, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Every one of us have to come to God through Jesus Christ. That's our common ground. That's our common blood, if you will. We are of one blood. We are of the same blood, and it's the blood of Christ, and we're supposed to make him our cornerstone. He is what sets the building. And if we'll stay within the confounds of Christ, the building will be built right the church will be built right. The kingdom will, build, will be built correctly. Our trouble is we want to go everywhere but to Christ and look at, look at everything but what we have in common. Today's message is real simple. It's real simple, but it, it's difficult when it comes to Monday morning and somebody that's a Christian is different than you or has a different political view than you. Cornerstone. Got to go back to that cornerstone that sets the outline for us, that sets the building for us. God's building something here, and he wants us each to be a part of it. Don't separate. Remember we talked about last week, separation is weakness. Together is, is strength. Separation is weakness. And what we have in common is just way too far important What's more important than anything that would separate us? And what we have in common is the blood of Jesus Christ and the Father God who, if we realized, <clears throat> if we realized hell, we don't talk much about hell around here. You know? We don't. It's not where our focus is. But out there, there's a world of people looking at eternity in a very bad way. And if Anna and I can agree on what color the pews are supposed to be or not, it's really stupid when we're talking about it's affecting lives outside the walls. What goes on in here is affecting lives outside the walls. And if we have an issue, sometimes we need to talk about church government. And how to handle division in the church. But the scripture is really plain. If Jonathan has a problem with me, he needs to come to me. And if we can't make it right, then we bring somebody else in, a mediator, if you will, somebody of spiritual maturity, and we sit down together with them and we try to make it right. But what's happened in today's church culture is when we get mad, we leave. can't leave family so we've got to generate a culture of family one father one mission build the kingdom do the works of Christ equip you to do it encourage you to do it make you want to do it that's what encourage to do it means to me don't just drive it home that you need to be doing this you need to no, but to make you want to be a part of it to make you enjoy Spreading the kingdom, growing the kingdom, doing the works of Christ. And then when those situations come and you have a problem 
And I tell you, if somebody else comes to you about church leadership or even, even we don't have memberships, in case you're wondering, we don't have church members. If you come here, you, welcome <laughs> your family. If somebody comes to you about Dylan or somebody comes to you about Ava, you know, the best thing you can do is say, let's pray about that. And if you say, let's pray about that, pretty much the conversation's over if they're just out there to be in strife. And if, but if they really do have a problem and you say, let's pray about that, and they sincerely pray with you about it, either way, you've handled it. Let's stop leaving the family over things that really don't matter. We're, God's building something here. He's building something in the River Valley, and I like it. And if it's this church or another church, as long as it's building the kingdom of God, I'm in. Amen. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. We pray that this message has uplifted, encouraged, and motivated you today. You can find us online at rccenter.org or visit us at 305 Lakefront Drive, Russellville, Arkansas.